she told me this way, so, yeah. And a mana, and a rare, and a iwi o te moto, ra ringa tira ma, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katou. I'm extremely pleased to be able to extend a welcome to you, to Tūrāia, to Conservation Week, and to the speakers for this evening, Sam Mann, Peter Wells, Glenn Hurd, Lucy Gray, and Axel Willoughby. As you can see from the screen, I'm Margaret Austin, standing in for Lan Palm, who regrettably is not very well. But it's to Axel and Lan that our thanks must go for their commitment to the challenges we face and for taking action to reduce emissions and for building community action. Now, I first of all have to remind you of where the exits are. Actually, where you came in. <laughs> and the toilets are through the exit, just down past the lifts and to your right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the theme for this evening centres on the most important issue of today and indeed the rest of this century. And it involves every single one of us. But climate change is more than the environment. Human survival is at risk, and it is the environment we must care for if Homo sapiens and the myriad of aquatic and terrestrial biota are to survive. Our health and our environment depend upon us and us alone. We must take action, we must be practical, but we must avoid creating a blame culture. We have to make personal commitments to adopt the solutions and community and national policies must be evidence informed. Our speakers this evening are here to raise awareness, to make sure that we are informed and to inspire us to get behind ensuring we elect people to local councils to lead us towards to sustainability. So let's hear first from Peter Wells. Peter is the guru behind the Otakara Auction Project with a background in arts and ecology. He is very persuasive and informed on the importance of climate stability for our food production. Thank you, Margaret, and to everyone. So, to bring the, to bring the horizon of what we're talking about out to its fullest extent, around the world we're in a really particularly dire place. We've lost in the last century alone. About half of the world's topsoil, over 2 billion hectares of our planet's terrestrial surface are degraded, and on top of that, we're losing about 24 billion tons of soil per year. That's a pretty, that's not a great spot to be in, given that we essentially have, we have about 10 years to effectively halve the world's carbon emissions, and to do so every successive decade through 2050 if we're going to make it through this really hard crunch in our future on this planet. So looking around at that, out of that agriculture and our food production systems play a massive role in this. It accounts for around 13% of our global emissions, takes up a huge chunk of our planet's land, about 70% of our fresh water, um, and around the world um, our, food, our food essentially goes through major fluxes where for the last 14, 14 odd thousand years, we've been practicing agriculture and not just working within the, the forests and the ecosystems that we, that we have on our planet, but, all, but exceeding them and, co and commodifying them into, into spaces that we cultivate intensively. Now what happens essentially, the persistent trend that we see is we take a piece of land, we exploit it for its natural resources, take away the native cover, ultimately degrade the soil through intensive and greedy cultivation and bankrupt that system, which in turn throws the society that's sitting on top of that landscape into chaos. 
Now, if we're gonna see a way out of this persistent cycle that's got us into this really hard point, we need to look at the role that the entire globe's food system is playing. Out of that, you see us down there in the bottom right corner, and we're a pretty tiny piece of the overall puzzle. But out of that, we are actually doing quite a bit for the, for the world's global agricultural system. Predominantly, we're growing, here in Canterbury, let alone elsewhere, we're growing 65% of the world's carrot seeds, among other things. And our exports of beef, lamb, and dairy go around the world um, to a multitude of different countries. But out of this, out of little old Aotearoa, this is, this is incredibly important for us that we figure out how to deal with our food resilience within the bounds of our, of our geography here. Because as, as, the, as things heat up around the globe and the, and the resource systems that we've got now become increasingly unstable, food prices will escalate and the costs of importing things will, will skyrocket. And over, and over time, we're going to see those systems and those trade, those trade partnerships that we depend on will, will be eroded substantially. So within Aotearoa, we are incredibly blessed. We've got an amazing country that has a third of its land mass in conservation and an amazing profile of soils underneath it. We're still a young country. And although most of this space is in agriculture, or, um, we, we have a really, really rich uh, profile to draw from here. So looking at this whole landscape, we've got a pretty widespread of latitudes and ecosystems that can grow everything from food in the very bottom of the South Island all the way up to the very top of the north in a semi-tropical environment. Now that's an amazing landscape to be working with, and out of that, one of the best one of the best pieces of that that we have is right here in Canterbury. Now Canterbury has for well over hundreds and hundreds of years been the breadbasket of the South Island. It's been an amazing site for Mahanga Kai. Um, and, and, a, and a space where a lot of, a lot of uh, South Island's food has been grown persistently over that time. But today we're not looking so great in terms of what we've got on the land in Canterbury. Out of that, in the, top, in the top left there, you'll see a little graph just detailing the percentage of food production um, that's, that's happening in, across the region. The vast majority of that you, that you see is sheep and beef. Um, but there's an ever-increasing margin of dairy that's come through that. Um, and there's an almost negligible amount of fruits and vegetables um, that's, and forestry that's grown across the entire landmass. Looking at all of that landscape and seeing all that bright green, all of that farm and pastoral landscape, that's a fragment of the forests and the, uh, and the landscape that was here originally. And what we see today on the Canterbury Plains is less than one half of 1% of our native biodiversity. Now what we fought that for predominantly is mostly large scale grazing, um, but producing crops that are producing a yield which is, which is mostly exported, and which we aren't able to utilize right here in the region to cover all of our, all of our needs. What we've got here today also though in Christchurch is, is a real opportunity to fix that. I would say in New Zealand in total, many people will ask over time, how on earth do we feed this entire country? To which I would respond, many other people would too. The United Kingdom, among other places in the world, have asked, uh, can they feed themselves in a pinch? And the answer is unequivocally yes, under a variety of different scenarios. So here in Aotearoa, we should be able to do the same. Now, this in, now given that 85% of New Zealand's citizenry and population is based in cities like Christchurch, they put, they put such a predominant amount of pressure on that on us to, to really account for the amount of food we're consuming. And without the region around us, without the wider the Canterbury area, we would, we would really struggle to make even a tiny portion of our own food need in this city. Most cities around the world produce less than 1% of their own food need, and we're no exception to that. But here in Christchurch, we actually, with the help of the wider region, have a, have a real ability to change that. And that goes all the way from, from the original ecology that we're built on, which is actually a really rich range of, of high quality soils that the city's been built on top of. And this is something we need to take into account as we're designing our city and the wider area around it for the future. But what's really extraordinary about this is unlike many cities in the world, we're ahead of the game. Around the city, we have, we have about 8,000 hectares of parks and green spaces, 
um, that accommodate a vast range of different reserves, we'll build in uh, all sorts of unseen benefits for our mental health and well-being, our physical health, um, improve our property values, but especially can grow our food. Because beyond those, those hectares and reserves, we've got over 70, over 70 different community gardens and schools, and 32 community gardens stretched across all of our landscapes in the city. And to boot on top of that, we've got over 26,000 fruit trees on our public land, just in Christchurch. So despite the fact that we're only producing a tiny segment of food that we need to really thrive and to keep ourselves resilient in face of disaster and of, and of global turmoils, um, climate challenges, we have a real opportunity to flip that around. And moreover, if we are able to work across the entire region of Canterbury into, into stepping forward and really encouraging best practices, forging those relationships with local producers and ensuring that more of our food comes from this locality and this region, we're going to make a huge dent in not just the country's emissions, but model this behavior for the rest of the world and encourage other bioregions around, around the globe to actually bring this all back to within a level that's not just going to be good for their local economies, their well-being and health, but is also hopefully going to solve one piece of this massive challenge that we've got in front of us. indeed, Peter, that was a timely warning. And you know what you were top said to me without even saying it? What on earth are we building houses on marshland for? Yes. <laughs> it, it pains me every time I drive down there, which I do once a week. Uh, but never mind. Thank you very much for the message <laughs> and the reminder. Uh, ben Hurd, farmer and entrepreneur, is next. He has a great story to tell of failure and success and how we simply have to rethink our farming practices. Welcome. Thank you very much. I, um, I call myself the most successful, unsuccessful dairy farmer. <laughs> with, um, we, um, Basically, the, the theory behind the Happy Cow Milk Company is that we can farm in a, uh, animal agriculture sustainably and ethically, but we have to do it with other forms of agriculture. Cows are okay, but they're part of an ecosystem, and we have to work them with other with crops and, and trees and, and various um, uh, various other forms of agriculture to try and um, I suppose mimic what we see in, uh, in in nature. But as you know, that is not really what we do with uh, with dairy cows really in New Zealand or around the world. So um, I thought what I'd do is just talk a little bit about how dairy farming in New Zealand has progressed and how we have sort of got to where we are today and understand how it might look if you're a dairy farmer and um, how the future um, may look to them because it's important to, I suppose we need to understand how everyone feels in the debate before we can actually make any change. So if we look at this, um, the green line is the, the average herd size. And back in the 1980s, where average cows were in 140 um, cows per herd, and now we're up to 460. And the gray line is the number of herds. So we've got less farmers, there's around 11,500 farmers now compared to around that 16,000 back in the 80s. And it's really consolidation, and we've seen this in, in all sorts of aspects um, around the world. Uh, and it's really economies of scale. It's to get bigger to become more efficient. And we've certainly seen that in dairy, the dairy industry. This is a distribution of the herds. If we look, um, around that 200 cows is really where most of our farmers are. Those are North Island farmers. Um, you know, that 200 to 350 cows is what used to be a, well, it's what we call a family farm, I suppose, whatever that term means. In, in Canterbury, the average herd size is 800 cows. And if we look towards the, the left there, so Canterbury is really a bit of an outlier when it comes to herd size. We're very big um, compared to the rest of the country. So when we talk about dairy farmers, it's, it's almost a little bit different. The Canterbury dairy farmer is slightly different. The, their motivations for going farming are slightly different. If you own 200 cows at Taranaki, um, you 
kind of got a different mindset to if you want to own 1,500 cows in Canterbury. And I, I don't want to make too many assumptions, but we've got much more of a corporate agriculture feel here in Canterbury, and uh, a lot of uh, syndicates, or I suppose a different sort of a different sort of person. And whatever that means, um, that's really what we have. So. Canterbury produces, uh, well, Canterbury dairy farms produce more on than the rest of the country. They, um, and it comes down to feed efficiency. We grow feed fairly well in Canterbury due to lots of sunlight and, of course, we have irrigation. The, the stocking rate is also quite a bit higher in Canterbury, 21% um, higher, in fact. And again, we have this, we have lots of sunshine. And then when you add irrigation and you, to sunshine, we get this long growing season. And where other parts of the country you may run into a bit of a drought or you um, run out of grass a little bit early in the autumn, you dry off the cows. In Canterbury, we can sort of extend that, or farmers can extend that longer. And uh, they actually grow more grass in Canterbury because those, over that summer period where it's nice and warm and you've got plenty of sunlight, you grow lots of grass. So the, we'll talk about the the, uh, the side effect of that in a second. So when you put those two together, our production per hectare in Canterbury is significantly higher than the rest of the country. And it's, you know, 32% is a significant amount of, um, of production. So if you're a, uh, an average dairy farmer, you're worth $18 million, which is a horrendous amount of money. And of that, around half of that is, is debt and then you have an equity of around nine, $9 million as well. So if you sold, or if a Canterbury farm is sold now, the average one, you know, they still have $9 million in the bank there. Of, of that $18 million, they make around 1.5% return on asset. So there's a $300,000 net profit. So after you've, you've taken off your principal, your interest, your, your working expenses, and paid all your wages, you're left with $300,000. When you've got, um, so what that means is that the farmers are quite wealthy, but yet they're also not. You know, when you'll hear them say, we haven't got the money to pay for this, and it's partly true because in a business that size, you can burn through $300,000 very, very easily. Just a combination of interest rate rise, maybe feed costs go up a little bit, um, the silage wagon breaks down, all these sorts of things. Next thing you know, you're making a loss. So. The underlying principle of dairy farming has always been capital gain. It's, it's, it's about, uh, it's property investing basically. And from 1978 through to 2014, every year dairy land is basically appreciated by 10% per annum. And it's really just happened like clockwork. And the entire system is based on that. So banks, um, we're into that, banks like lending on security. Um, try starting a business with no security, and the banks won't really like you, but if you've got a house, if you've got land, if you've got security, um, they're your friend, and they've loved dairy farming because they can lend you lots of money, and essentially, eventually, you'll get your way out of it because your land increases in value. The dairy conversions have been able to make a much greater uh, capital gain. You could buy a sheep farm, put your cow shed on it, and then you double your money, and then you make your 10%. And that's essentially why we've seen this big expansion of dairy across the country. Um, if you add that capital gain into these this financial figures, you get a much more uh, respectable return, I suppose, 8%. So if you assume that there's 10% capital gain on that on $15 million worth of land, add the $300,000 profit, you've got your 10%. The problem with the dairy industry at the moment is they're not actually getting that capital gain. On top of that, Fonterra has lost half its value in the past 12 months, and now fresh water proposals are coming through to restrict their nutrient outputs. So they're a little bit stressed about what they're going to do. Um, I'm not, but they are. I delved through, I delved into some of the um, the research around our nitrate levels in, in our waterways around the country. And what we find is around 11% are over the one milligram per litre. So the new freshwater proposals are suggesting that uh, catchments need to have a limit 
of rivers need to have no more than one milligram of nitrate, or it's, well, let's just call it nitrate, per litre of, um, of water. Of those 11% um, of the, um, let me go back, yes, so the 11% that don't comply, that are over the one, the one mega, milligram, 58% um, of them are only just over, they're between one and two. The red section is the, um, is the next segment, two to three milligrams, and that's, those two segments together make up, um, what's that, 80%. The problem we have is that um, the remaining 20% make up basically 40, riverway, uh, 40 rivers or waterways. Of those 40 riverways, the most polluted riverways in New Zealand, 20 of them are in Canterbury. Um, the rest are evenly distributed throughout New Zealand, a few in South and a few in Auckland, Taranaki and so on and so forth, but half of them are right here in Canterbury. They're around the Waituna Lagoon and they're around Hines. Um, and this isn't talking about groundwater either, this is just talking about the riverways. And what we've essentially got is we've got dry land Canterbury with stony soils. We've added irrigation, which used to run a couple of woolly sheep, which have very low nitrogen or nutrient inputs. And we've added dairy cows who have large nutrient um, outputs. And essentially we run the highest stocking rates than we do in the rest of the country. We feed them a lot more, so they produce more milk, they also produce more nutrients, and we're starting to see the issues around it. So I just wanted to briefly run through what the financials look, because the reason we're getting a big kickback from farmers is they believe it's impossible to change. And they're, they're saying this at the moment, they're saying we just physically actually can't reduce our stocking rates and so on and so forth. Um, at Happy Cow Milk, we reduce, we run two cows per hectare, and so that's around 40 to 50% of reduction on stocking rate. And by changing our business model and selling direct to the consumer, they actually make 40% more per hectare than the current dairy industry. So I'm not saying that it's easy, you have to, you have to think radically differently, and you have to do things radically differently, but it is possible. But what I'm very aware of through my weekly column is that farmers are very, um, very touchy and very, excuse me, that's my 10 minutes, that they're feeling very vulnerable. And whether it's right or wrong, this has been well signaled since 2008. I don't think anyone should be surprised that nutrient restrictions are coming into place. But um, hopefully that just um, gives you a little bit of an understanding of uh, what life's like when a uh, $18 million dairy farm. <coughs> Thank you very much, Ben. We could have taken a little bit more, uh, I think, and got a few more salutary lessons, but at least what you've done to me, <coughs> I've taken off the uh, gown and the mortarboard that I used to wear as Chancellor of Lincoln because I was involved in the first conversion of the sheep farm on Lincoln's property into a dairy farm. But it was to be experimental and we put the lysimeters down to make sure that we knew what the runoff, the nitrate runoff was. So that's the basis of the information that you've been able to use to draw attention to us uh, for us this evening. So I'm putting back on the gown. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, because the lessons that you gave to us were extremely important, and particularly when you referred uh, so well to the debt levels and the farming for capital gain, and what we've got to do is to turn it all around and do what you're doing, and that is farm for sustainability as well. Now, Lucy, where are you? Oh, she's wait, she's hiding, she's hiding. Lucy Gray is our hope for the future and in whom we have great confidence. Here she is, 12 years old, year eight, and already out leading her mates and friends 
to make sure that they are engaged and knowledgeable and ready to exercise their leadership and their knowledge and lead the uh, strike for climate. She is saying, and her generation is saying, enough is enough. We've got a climate crisis, we must raise awareness, and we must make sure that we've got an informed public ready to take action. So the school strike climate team is ready to take action, and they have, and what's more, those of us who can claim to be antique have stood up and taken notice. Lucy, all yours. We need to speak out. 
We need to ask the obvious questions and the hard questions. We need to recognise that those who are least responsible for climate change will suffer the most. And we need to work together to build a safe, secure and healthy future for all. We all have an important part to play. As individuals, we can look to our homes, schools, workplaces and ask, what difference can I make? This will be different for each of us. Having climate conversations with friends starting a group in your school, having a veggie sharing group in your street, committing to waste-free days with your workmates, changing to carpooling, busing or biking, or implementing sustainable business practice. As individuals, we all have our part to play. However, it is coming together as a community that we have the biggest impact. Through collective action, we can demand that our local and national leaders step up. They can make the climate crisis a priority in every decision. The Zero Carbon Bill and ECAN and Council's declaration of a climate and ecological emergency are important steps in a long road and make it clear that business as usual cannot go on. However, we must demand more from our local leaders, more from businesses, more from our politicians, the science is clear, our planet is in crisis and we need bold, urgent action. I come to these forums because as a child of the next generation, I refuse to inherit the consequences of inaction. Refuse to stand on the sidelines and watch my future be destroyed. As young people, we are desperately concerned for our futures. It is imperative to protect us and safeguard the children of this generation. We need our leaders to work together, put aside poli political differences. We need businesses to value people over profit. We need enforceable and ambitious targets. We need plans from councils and government. We need a parliament to acknowledge the magnitude of the climate crisis and take decisive action. And we need local representatives like you to show leadership and deliver your promises. We have the chance to take this global challenge and use it as an opportunity, a, a vehicle for positive change, to create a more just world. So please, if this matters to you, support us and stand with us on Friday for our interge intergenerational climate strike. We need to work together. We need to move past the dollar signs, the politics and the apathy and ask, how can we preserve the future for the next generation? Thank you. What an inspiration and your terreo is absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. We talked about people in power. Why has it taken us 50 years? Some of you, like me, will remember Silent Spring and Rachel Carson. And did we take any notice? Not really. Not, what's worse than not really? It didn't matter what you said. Oh, she's nuts and she was rejected out of hand. That 1.5 million people stood up on March the 15th was wonderful. And you referred also, where is she? I can't even, oh, she's disappeared. There she is. To climate change refugees. I went to the court theatre the other night, to the forge, and saw the most wonderful, inspirational, presentation on what it's going to be like to spend your uh, the last day on the island of Kiribati when the sea comes in. It was actually Vanuatu they were talking about, but, they, but it, 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 it really we ought to be talking about Kiribati. Lucy, you told us we're not doing terribly well, but you see, there's something else. Nobody's mentioned it yet, but I've got another hat on, and some of you will know that I've been into 
dark skies for a very long time. And I've been saying that if we don't do something about light pollution, we'll have the entire nation on sleeping pills. <laughs> Lucy, you want to make a difference. You've already taken action. You have a set of values. And don't make any mistake. We'll be following you on Friday. seats up the front. Uh, uh, there's four, five, six that I can see. Please come and join us. I've been sitting all day. <laughs> <laughs> You're growing good, are you? <laughs> all right. Now our next speaker is, is Axel Wilkie. He's totally committed to sustainable transport, right? That's correct. Also to cycle safety and the New Zealand Cycle Trail. But Axel, there's one thing you need to know. And that is, the only cycle I'm capable of using these days is a stationary one. But I do have one and I use it daily. That doesn't mean to say I don't support his endeavours, I do. And also, the importance of innovative transport solutions are one of the keys to the future, which regrettably have been sadly neglected. But Axel's got a great story to tell too of the significance of greenhouse emissions through local transport and the importance of us really taking a good hard look at ourselves. So what I've been doing, Axel, for some months, every time I see a bus I count the passengers. And how many are there? Usually between three and six and they're all over the town. So I don't know what you're going to suggest, but I'm looking forward to hearing from you. So you've spent a career in leadership positions in local government, in transport systems. And so we welcome you to give us a few lessons on what we're going to face and what we're going to have to do. Thank you. my latest video, I got the shock of my life listening to a long presentation by a climate scientist on the immediacy and scale of our climate and ecological crisis. So I need to do something that's within my capability. Why am I spending 40 k Because transport makes up half of our local greenhouse gas emissions. And if people have no alternative to driving, what are they supposed to do? ECAN controls public transport, and whilst they spend nearly half their budget on running it, they are rather average in doing so. Surprisingly, they have never had a transport expert around the decision-making table. <laughs> Remember this time last year? The um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued its uh, special report, and they said, to have a 50% chance doesn't sound like good odds. Of staying within one and a half degrees of warming, our greenhouse gas emissions must fall by 45% below 2010 levels by 2030. So if each sector contributing to greenhouse gas emissions reduces its own impact, how much would we have to reduce driving? So I've had a look. In Christchurch, in 2010, we drove 
3.35 billion kilometers. That's a 4,357 return trips to the moon. And if that number is a little bit challenging to comprehend, how about 11 return trips to the sun? <laughs> so let's just assume that greenhouse gas emissions are directly proportional to the distance driven, and which is a bit simplified, but let's just do this. So in order to meet the IPCC target for 2030, uh, we need to knock off two and a quarter percent distance driven per year. Easy? Trouble is, we've since added 15% distance to that what we drove in 2010. And now we need to reduce our yearly travel distance by 4.7%. And the longer we keep going on with business as usual, the bigger our annual reduction will have to be. So what is business as usual? In Greater Christchurch, we have rather strong population growth. Every 10 years, we add 100,000 people to our population. And with that come an additional 90,000 cars. And I've highlighted the scary bit and uh, crossed it out a bit as well. <laughs> <laughs> we could not physically fit that many cars into Greater Christchurch every decade if we tried, and that's beyond the climate implications from it. So this is another reason to reduce our car-based travel. We need to act, we need to do things differently. <coughs> so what's the current state of play? Electric vehicles make a quarter of a percent of our car fleet in Christchurch. But EVs is not the total solution. As 50% of greenhouse gases of a car uh, happens during manufacture. So that's not quite it. Public transport. The use is declining. We have 250 public buses running around, of which three have been electric for the last few weeks. Cycling is increasing fast, 10% per year. The city council is doing something right. But we have an incredibly high car ownership, as Lucy pointed out, 913 vehicles per 1,000 population. That is 100 cars more than the United States, which we think of as being car mad. That's 200 cars more than Wellington or Auckland. On this chart here, we're looking at bus usage in Christchurch over the last 20 years. We're looking at the number of trips per person per annum. We experienced strong growth in the early 2000s. Post earthquake, we were well on the way to recovery when he can reduce the hubs and spokes model. What it basically means is that your suburban bus will not get you into the city center, but you'll have to change to a different bus in one of the hubs like Northlands or Eastgate or Riccarton. This was not a good decision, and we've had declining patronage ever since. I know what to do. I went into engineering because of my interest in sustainable transport. I've got more than two decades of industry experience. I'm one of the senior experts held in high regard in New Zealand, trusted with teaching the profession and writing guidelines. I know what it's doing, and I know what won't work. I would never have signed off on the hubs and spokes model. It was predictable. Here's how we compare to the other two big centers in New Zealand. Wellington, much higher than us, steady as Auckland. In 2008, they had exactly the same usage in public transport as we did. They've left us in the dust. 
they are growing faster than almost any other city in the world with their public transport use. Phenomenal. It's not that we New Zealanders don't know how to do it. It's just that we don't know how to do it here in Christchurch. So what needs doing? We need to sort out our um, our governance. The uh, regional council and the city council have split responsibilities for public transport, and that needs looking at. And because we don't have the governance sorted, and nobody in this region is providing leadership with public transport, we are missing out on funding. This chart shows you that Auckland invests five times as much on public transport per person as we do in Canterbury. And half of that money comes from central government. We need a fair uh, review so that we attract new users. For example, the initial metro card definitely has to be free. We need to turn irregular users into common users by having uh, monthly or annual passes which make public transport use cheap. Free weekend travel is something that was just introduced by Auckland in Hamilton and we are not even talking about it. Other things that need to improve include reliability, coverage, frequency of services, but I won't go into those tonight. Up until the earthquakes, we had the free shuttle, and this was its route. People loved it, and many wanted back. It was, would cost us one and a half million per year to have it back, and I have a much better idea. I'd make all buses free within the four Fs for metro car holders. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that leaves out Darren Park, by the way, because he hasn't got one. <laughs> you can go much more places than the shuttle. This would cost practically nothing, as most current users are coming from or heading to outside of the four apps. So free buses within the four Fs compared to the shuttle gives us better coverage, a much better frequency, and saves us close to one and a half million per year. But much more importantly, it turns people into bus users. You know, we give people a metro car, and the initial one is going to be free again as it was until 2011, and we'll give up to Dale Park as well. <laughs> and then people learn about the bus network because they need to figure out where they want to go within the city. And these things are important steps for them to use paid public transport. This is how we grow our ridership. This is going to be paper, I'm sorry. We also need to get back into passenger rail. The Middleton and Wollaston Transformation Initiative, MARTI, was announced to the public by the Chat Club, a group I co-founded last year. It's our first combined housing and rail initiative with 1,600 houses proposed for the Middleton Shunting Yard, the red area there in the corner, around a, a new rail station, and the rail would connect Rolleston with Christchurch as shown with that dotted line. The exciting part of Marty is that we would use, that we would run tram trains on the heavy rail network. That means that when we later extend the line into the city, we only have to build tram tracks, which are much cheaper. We can have stops at the stadium, the bus interchange, in a hospital. Hmm. That's what we need to get to. 
that will help us travel without burning fossil fuels. So in conclusion, greenhouse gas emissions from driving are our number one problem here locally in Christchurch. We need to start addressing this now. Public transport is in rather poor shape. There are significant improvements that are needed. The governance must change. We really need to go after new users, turn your regular users into uh, regular users, and we need to get passenger rail out again. Thank you very much. And then when you get into a seat, you know perfectly well that you are one voice and you're not going to make any difference at all unless you've got the majority with you. And so we've got to make sure that you have got people there to support you because the initiatives that you've outlined are absolutely critical to what we can do in this city, not to lead, but simply to catch up. And the notion of the rail link between um, Ralston and the, and the city, but going the other direction also between the city and Rangiora, doesn't, it, 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 we really don't have to think about it. We should, we should be activating it. Mm. But you know, I'm going to be naughty now. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little story, and it's very personal. And to some extent, I think it reveals how my generation, which is greater than anyone in the room, uh, has got tangled up in this issue. My husband and I went to England on leave from the university in 1956. We spent absolutely our last Penny, and I'm not kidding, penny, buying a Vauxhall Wyvern off the Earl's Court Motor Show. Why did we do that? Because unless you had overseas funds, you couldn't buy one in New Zealand. We drove it for 366 days, note what I said, in order to avoid British purchase tax and New Zealand import duty, and we brought it home in December of 1957. Jack in his wisdom thought, now we've got this command economy in New Zealand, I suppose it would be a good idea to put a name down for a new car, which he did at the farmer's garage. Now I'm not kidding you, when were we offered a new car? September 1969, and the message was, we have a green Vauxhall Velox 3.3 cc engine, would you mind? It's got black upholstery, we need an answer by five o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> now, that sort of background, I think, tells you something about the way in which some of us have got a great reluctance to use the bus. But we have to, we have to change our lifestyle. And Axel, you have the answers, thank you. <laughs> Sam, on your feet please. <laughs> Sam Mann is going to take the stage He's a recent pensioner, don't you know? Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> I've got family here, they don't know I'm <laughs> I couldn't help myself. <laughs> He's an artist and environmentalist. 
And do you know what's uppermost in his mind? That inimical chemical H2O. Sam, you've got a great reputation. It has preceded you. And we want to hear now how you're going to achieve pristine waterways in this country. He's an expert in creativity and also in telling us exactly what we ought to know and how we ought to hear it. So, Sam, you're welcome to take the stage and give us a blast. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Can you hear me here? It's going to be useful to plug the microphone. This is kind of difficult because it means I can't dance. Um, this is the R18. Uh, small, this is the R18 section here. So anybody who is sensitive, this is your time today. Do you want to get up in your seats and just turn around once and sit down again? Would that be okay? Just to. Yeah. Yeah. Climate change talk. I thought this was a literary event, and I came here to talk about Tolstoy. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, Mark, you remember when we were in university, if you had War and Peace on your arm, you know, you, you were going to win all the girls. I couldn't manage it because I thought I'll never get through this thing by the time I finish my degree. So instead, I went and I got the death of Ivan Ilyich. Have you read that? Tolstoy, beautiful book. It's about the consequences of living their life without meaning. Oh. Now you guys, you know, you know all the problems we're facing. I don't have to reiterate them because these guys have done it for us, especially Lucy. I want to apologize to her on behalf of my generation, but it would take too long. <laughs> but that book, The Death of Ivan, Ivan Ilyich, what struck me about it, he was a man, he was a magistrate in a provincial town in Russia. And he loved his social position that being a magistrate gave him. But he didn't want to deal with raw material, which, which he had to sort of, because of his job, had to deal with. And so he used the, the debris of his office. He used his, his, his official cloak and the people who worked in his office, and he used the office itself. He used the official documents that people would sign to make petitions. He used all that stuff to separate himself from what Tolstoy referred to as the sap of life. It made him uncomfortable. Yet the sap of life is an important thing. It's always stayed with me that that that, that one that one line. Now, a few years ago, when the ECAN Act was put into place, Nick Smith and Rodney Hyde. Remember Rodney Hyde? We got this. They came down. Uh, they were doing this sort of victory lap of the rural constituencies, and they came to Hurunui District Council, which is our council. And we went down to hear what Nick had to say because we'd read Philip Joseph's report, and he, he wrote a report for the. Law Society Rule of Law uh, review on the ECAN Act, in which he claimed that it was the ECAN Act itself was repugnant to the rule of law. It contravened the principles of natural justice, uh, constitutional law, and the Bill of Rights. So I thought, well, what's Nick got to say? Because you know, he's done some damage to us. So we went down. I'm speaking fast because I've only got 20 minutes, okay? <laughs> we went down to the council, we sat in the public gallery, and next to us walked in with Rodney Hyde, and Rodney was wearing his pinstriped suit and little polished black shoes, kind of the same guy that Al Capone used to wear. And I was thought to myself, well, the dirtier the job, the cleaner the clothes, right? And you remember Henry Thoreau said, beware of enterprises that require new clothes. He said, oh yeah, Rodney's got something to hide. He was beside himself. <laughs> Rodney was beside himself with pleasure because he was in the spotlight. He was the Sancho Panza to to Nick Smith, and he sat there at the table with all our counselors. His little feet were above the ground, and he was jiggling them as if, like a kid in the front row of a circus, you know, they, like his bladder was bursting, but he doesn't want to leave because he's scared of Mr. Clowns, which is silly, because they were right there at the table with him. <laughs> <laughs> there was the mayor, and there was all the counselors. And, and I, I remember, I was, I was thinking, um, one of those counselors, the mayor at the time was Gary Jackson, who's running for ECAN this year, and it was odd because he was part of the pirate gang that took over ECAN all those years ago and threw everybody to the sea, and now he wants to run as a member of the crew, which is odd to me. I hope he doesn't make any progress. When, when Nick had finished speaking to the council, 
and that all genuflected and kissed his ring. Um, the little ruby one. Um, they all disappeared into an adjoining room to the council chamber to have a cup of tea. Now, do you remember John Banks and John Key? They had the cup of tea, right? When a dirty deal is going down, it's the cup of tea. When Bill Bayshore of ECAN is faced with protesters, he invites them to have a cup of tea, and they think they're part of a collaborative arrangement. They're not. Bill's out the back doing a dirty deal. Jesus Christ and Judas Iscariot goes, Christ coming in. I said, sorry, I missed the last supper. He goes, where were you? He said, well, I had to see a man by a god, a, a dog. <laughs> He said, look, now you have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. So here these guys are having a cup of tea, we know something's happening, and we're all leaving the council chambers, all of us, looking like we've just been to a funeral. All the faces were grey, except for Joe Kane. Do you remember Joe Kane? Yeah. You should remember Joe Kane. She's a formidable lady. She's very tough. She has four arms the size of three year old salmon. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the green room with her, we didn't change once. She could bench press Rodney Hyde with one hour. Right? <laughs> Joe once swims, this is true, that Joe, this is true. Joe once, everything I said to you is true, but this is actual. <laughs> <laughs> Joe once swam crook straight. It was five years before the sharks came back. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're walking out of the council gate, and I've already been traveling. And Joe says, I'm looking, and then there's something I've got to do. And she walked over to where the room was, and she opened the door. And all the conversation side stopped. They must have had chairs from the local primary school, because all the politicians had their knees jutting up. You know how they do when they sit down in small chairs. Nick Smith had a saucer balanced on his knee, and Rodney Hyde had a lamington halfway to his lips. <laughs> and Joe leaned in the doorway, like, like Malena Dietrich on steroids. And they looked up at her, she looked down at them, and she said, Now, is anybody here under the age of 18? Um, this is my sign for it's going to be nasty, so clap your ears over anybody who's um, <laughs> underage. This was true. Joe looked at the. And, we, and she said, Boys, she said, we can all go and get fucked. And then she got the door and she slammed it. And we smiled because for the first time in an hour we've been in that chamber, someone had said something that they actually meant. <laughs> the 1st of May is an important time for Tolstoy, it was. The 1st of May is an important time in our family because it's my partner's birthday, the 1st of May, and every 1st of May, the down tools are hidden from the mountains. We go somewhere where there's nobody else, just some glade, some bit of peace, far from the man in crowd. And we took our daughter this one five years ago. We left home. It was a dark sky, there was nothing else, just stars up there. All of them Nikola Toki, I think, from memory. And we headed off towards uh, Porter's Pass. We crossed Porter's Pass. There was a drift of snow on the tops of the hills. And we, we headed, I don't know, in the general direction of, of uh, Arthur's Pass. Then we came to a shingle road. And I remembered how Ellie and I had walked for four days across the hills from our place to Flock Hill with only a bag of flour, uh, just for an egg, you know. By day four, we were absolutely starving, and we were holed up. And I think what used to be the old homestead at Flock Hill, it was all broken, there were just rats and possums in there. And I said, let's go back and see that place, and we'll have a birthday lunch around there, because it's some great memories. And as we were about 15 kilometers down that shingle road, we found a sign pinned to a tree, lopsided, pointing up to a ridge. And we got out of the car and climbed the ridge. And we looked over the edge, and there was this beautiful lake. Do you know, Richard, I think it was Lake Horton, and it was tucked into this lovely cleavage of Tuskegee Hills and Tawny, Tawny Hills, a beautiful little place, and this is the perfect spot for us. So we meandered our way down the hill, and Charlie was leading her invisible pony called Barney, and we arrived at the edge of the lake. There was an old tortured willow tree leaning back as if it had given up the fight against the Nor'wester. Mm -hmm. And there the grass was all dry, and the leaves were crisp, and there was a bumblebee fizzing like a dying firecracker. And I made a little fire into a, a cleft of earth because you've got to have a fire. You can't have a birthday party by a lake without a, a fire. Fire is a passion. Fire is the thing that we used to sit around and tell stories. Fire, we, we, we do it without permission. Because fire is passion, fire is love. Do you remember that scene from Dr. Shivago? There's that huge sweep of snow, and the, the horses are galloping towards the darker, and the whole, all that turmoil of Moscow is behind them. 
and for a moment they have refuge. This is darkened. And they go inside and the broken windows and the snow has drifted in and, and it looked just the snow on the table legs and the chairs and it's their refuge, it's their sanctuary. And for a moment they're happy, you can tell they're happy because the music is swelling up, right? <laughs> and then Shivago, he likes the fire. And as the fire glows, it spreads his arms as if to push back all the pessimism in the whole world. And he draws out a bearskin blanket, and at which point Lara doesn't say to Shivago, Yuri, put out the fire, let us make passionate love in front of a, a heat pump. <laughs> <laughs> because heat pumps, as we know, are a fascist conspiracy <laughs> to reduce us into a passionless society. So the, <laughs> so the beautiful billy is boiling and then Ellie took the billy off and then she put it in a handful of coffee grounds. She stirred it with a green willow stick because you've got to use a green willow stick and then she tapped the side of the billy and the ground sank and then she poured that coffee through an Andalusian scarf into two enamel mugs. And I'm sitting with the enamel mug, and Charlie's playing with an invisible horse, and Ellie's reading the book. And there's the lake, and two black swans come fishing over, and their heads are bent like question marks, and under their wings, they're holding all the secrets of that vast, tremble landscape. And that's coffee. It's coffee because it has context, it's been earned. Coffee does not come. In the chrome plated machine, you pay $2,000 for for crystals with kind of levers and whistles on it and a little thing that fizzles out the side, and two penises are hanging down the bottom to which the coffee dribbles like through the constrained prostate of an environmental judge. <laughs> <laughs> so I told Alice I'd bring Peter Skelton into this. So, um, <laughs> so coffee is context. Coffee machines are a fascist conspiracy to reduce us all into a fascist society. So when you're at a lake, you go to walk around it. You don't go to the lake, you just walk away again. So we did. We spent most of the rest of the day wandering through the, through the bush and picking up little things, specimens of things. There was one hole there for a beautiful water there in which there was a whole cow. And the cow had been there for a long time. It was just bones and gristle. And the gristle, bits of flesh, was sort of floating like pennants in this Invisible breeze. It's a beautiful sight. I wish I could see more of it. <laughs> and when we finished, we walked up to the ridge where we started. And I looked down. There was our car. And there was a railway line which I forgot all about. And there was a valley. And on the other side of the valley, there was another ridge where I stood when I was 25 years old, having been washed off a raft in the Waimak. It was in full flood at the time, so we deserved it. <laughs> and Bill and I standing there, cold and wet and lost by the gear. The sun was setting and throwing one last shaft of light down the valley, which is illuminating the railway line. It looked like a thin silver ribbon. And I thought, is that all that holds this world together? If that snaps, do the mountains fall down? Do the rivers come loose? Do the lakes drift into the sky and become clouds? And it took us about an hour to cross the wetlands to get to that railway line. The sun was set and we were cold, and there was a wild apple tree. And we picked apples and we were munching the apples. And I thought of my mother at five years old driving in that train to Arthur's Pass where my grandfather was a station master and with her packed lunch she would have been eating an apple and thrown it out the window and that core would have made, I, and I wondered at the foresight of mothers. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally we heard the, the ah, we heard the distant cry of a train approaching and that yellow light sweeping around the hills and Bill stood in the middle of the railway line, washed with light like a crucifix and then the train came by and the guard's van drew alongside, and the guard said, where are you going, boys? So we're trying to get to Christchurch. He said, you're lucky we're going there, too. <laughs> <laughs> so he took us on board, and he charged us nothing, because we lost all our money. He sat us down in the carriage. Don't worry about pain, he said. And the lady sitting next to us offered us her sandwiches, which we ate. And it was kind of expected, and she smiled, because these were the days when everybody still liked each other, right? <laughs> Before Douglas and Preble and Cable took everything from us, including the railways, and sold them to their friends for $10. Two minutes? Sorry. But that night when we got home, Ellie and Charlie and I, it was still, we were under the stars again, we arrived back and still, the stars we left, we came back to the stars, we put Charlie to bed, a little fire, and there on my table was one more letter for weekend. One more invitation to write a submission to a lost cause. And I wished at that moment that I had a cupboard with a pinstripe suit in it, with little polished shoes, 342 other envelopes from weekend. I can throw this last one and slam the door and say what Joe said. You can all go and get fucked. And then, 
Later that night, I walked out onto the balcony, looked out at the black night, and I thought, in the distance, I imagined I could hear the lapping of water around the side of Lake Sumner, the trickling in the Jolly Brook into the North Branch of the Hurrimui, the confidence with the South Branch, that wonderful silence in the gorge is just above the mandamus, where the salmon lie, and where the children take their first leap of faith. There's a smell of wood smoke, there's blackberries, there's wild apples, there's two black swans, there's a cup of coffee with context. This amounts to the sap of life. Worth fighting for, do you think? Yeah. 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 to the sale of railways. Now, before I say what I'm going to say, your grandfather was the station master at Arthur's Pass. My father was the station master at Arthur's Pass. Oh, and his cow is there, yes, he is. And many a tale he could tell of going to the pub in Otila through the tunnel. Mm. <laughs> but, I'm well aware, because it was part of my time in Parliament, of the regrettable impact of the sale of things, including railways. But do not forget that we had endured an environment where 20,000 people were employed in the railway yards and on the tracks doing the job of roughly 5,000 people. But they were getting paid and the money kept on going to the community, so it was a close circle. And who was paying them? It wasn't the railways. But it wasn't and the then there was a further 5,000 people hosing down coal in Southland to save it from auto-igniting because they couldn't sell it. And okay, jobs went. But I'm going to say something, and it's political, because I've got, I'm, I'm arguing the point. I'd love to take the stage with you, and really, we could have such a debate. <laughs> but there was never a decision made from 84 to 88 that the question wasn't asked, who will it affect, and how can we mitigate it? So there. And I was part of those discussions. But... Margaret had better stop talking. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sam. You're welcome. You've wakened us up no end. I'm sure you're all very impressed and convinced with the, by the information that you've received tonight. We need to thank most sincerely each of our five presenters. They have provided us with a wealth of information which we've now got an obligation to make sure that we use our vote carefully and responsibly. Voting papers will come out probably in the mail in the next uh, day or two and we need to know now who it is is going to be working in our best interests to make sure that we've got the numbers around the table who will make the decisions that are in everybody's best interests. 
So there are leaflets downstairs available for you to take up, take home to read with information on them, particularly with reference to the Extinction Rebellion who are responsible for um, tonight's meeting. We have a huge challenge in front of us, and that's the information that's convened, being conveyed to us tonight. But remember, People action precedes community action, and community action leads to government action, policy development, and implementation of policies. So it's the people who have the power in a democracy, let's use it. If you feel you wish to, there's a little koha box available for you to put your hand in your pocket and then transfer something from your pocket into the Kohar box, and that will be gratefully received. To the young people, Lucy, I have a message for you. I think that what you ought to do is get into every old people's home in this town, <laughs> and you sit with the grannies and the granddads, and you say to them, they've got a duty. <coughs> support the young people but get your family out to vote and especially the young ones and who has the power to be persuasive because you know even though most of us at my age were trained never to be obedient the families have now trained us to be obedient so we do as we're told so it's the grannies and the granddads who will get things moving for you. And then we can all stand up and say, together we're going to win. Thank you very much for being here, for listening so attentively, and also for making sure now that you exercise your democratic right and go out and put some ticks beside the right names. Thank you very much indeed. few more words. Uh, um, firstly, uh, I, I would like to reflect on that tomorrow's coffee is probably going to taste a little different. Um, but uh, the, this event here came about because uh, Lan and I thought, um, um, let's make this happen. Let's kick off Climate Week in an appropriate manner. Lan and I are absolutely committed to make um, climate uh, change the uh, number one topic that we want to um, um, think about with every single decision uh, that faces us. So uh, thank you um, to all the people who have helped us uh, to uh, pull this off, uh, to organize this. Thank you for the speakers uh, to come along. And um, so yeah, uh, <coughs> Margaret has already given you all the um, um, important information. If um, um, if you feel really, really passionate to uh, support us, um, 12.30 at my place tomorrow, um, it's going to be a great thing for our last uh, big push uh, for door knocking. Um, 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 Julie will uh, organize this because I'm now heading off to the next event giving another speech. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the fact that they were being given soap, you shouldn't read too much into that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
I wouldn't take a photo of that. <laughs> Running for E can, here's a bottle of wine. Every old girl. The PR blunder. Thank you. Thanks very much.